They were the few who found the narrow way. The good news ends with a familiar warning in verse 30. He warned them to tell no one about Him. Warning, epitomao, strong, strong word, to command, to warn, to rebuke, very strong compound word, sternly commands them, do not, do not spread this around. Don't tell anybody about me. Why? Did He not want to excite His enemies? Some people think that. Did He not want to excite His friends? And now that they have said He's the Messiah, they're going to escalate to something like they did in John 6 when they try to make Him king by force. Remember that? After He had fed them? Is it because He doesn't want to excite His enemies or His friends? No. No. He's not going to diminish the hatred of His enemies, right? They're still going to be after Him, and they're going to hate Him all the way till they get Him on the cross. And He's still not going to be able to quell the excitement of some of His superficial friends. Witness a few months down the road when He enters into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, and the whole city is screaming at Him as the King, as the Messiah. He's not simply trying to keep His enemies off His back and keep His friends from pushing Him into things He doesn't want to do. I've told you before, and I say it again, the reason He says, don't tell anyone about this is because He's instructing the disciples that this is not the full message. He didn't want miracles spread around because it wasn't the full message that He was a miracle worker. To say He's the Messiah is not the full message. You can pronounce Jesus as the Messiah, but that's not the full message because it's missing the gospel. Well. That's evident because of the next verse, the bad news. Don't tell anyone. You've got more to learn. And he began, which means this became the theme of his teaching from here on out. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Bad news. The best news ever, just pronounced followed by the worst news. What a blow. The last thing they would expect on the heels of such a grand moment of revelation and clarity was a death announcement. How could the Messiah of God, the Redeemer of Israel, the conqueror of all God's enemies, suffer? Suffer? By the way, began to teach, it becomes the theme. Chapter 9, verse 31, as they go, He was teaching His disciples, telling them, Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. They'll kill Him. When He's been killed, He'll rise. Three days later. Chapter 10, verse 33, Behold, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They'll condemn Him to death, hand Him over to the Gentiles. They'll mock Him, spit on Him, scourge Him, kill Him. Three days later, He'll rise again. What's the point of all this? Well, He says it in verse 45 of chapter 10, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give His life a ransom for. He came to give His life a ransom for many. He would unfold that for them. Why are you going to die? Why are you going to die? You must suffer. It's a little particle day. It means it's necessary. It is required that you suffer many things. What do you mean many things? Betrayal, arrest, denial, abandonment, injustice, prison, mockery, beating, crucifixion disaffection from His disciples, etc., etc. You're going to suffer many things, the Father determined, and be rejected. Apodakimadzo. Dakimadzo means to test something to see if it's true, to validate it, to assess it. This is a compound form of that, and it means to reject after investigation. Jesus will suffer many things. One of those things will be an investigation. First Annas, Caiaphas, then Herod, then Pilate, all the mock trial. The verb is carefully selected. After examination, after assessment, after testing, He will be rejected as flawed and faulty and false, but not without some kind of form of careful consideration. All of this comes to a head in the trials of Jesus. And the strange, bizarre aspect of it is 
that it's not going to be by pagans and it's not going to be by self-confessed wicked godless men, but all of this is going to come by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. The Sanhedrin conducted all of that. They were the ones responsible for His betrayal. They bought Judas for His arrest. They were the ones who brought about the mock trials. They were the ones who handed Him over to the Romans for all the physical abuse. They were the ruling council of Judaism. They were the elite, seventy men. They were made up of elders, or were judges, tribal heads, chief priests. Those would be the temple system priests, the Sadducees, the religious liberals. And then there were the scribes who would be the Pharisees. So it was a coalition government made up of Pharisees, Sadducees who were enemies theologically, and other important leaders in the community and judges. And they constituted this coalition religious governing body over Israel, and it was they who would be responsible for the killing of the Messiah. How could they ever process this? I guess they didn't think of Isaiah 53. He would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace would fall on Him, and by His stripes we would be healed. Isaiah 53 lays it out, the, the suffering servant. The servant will suffer and die. And so the bad news comes on the heels of the good news, and it's the worst news imaginable. It's incomprehensible. They can't even process it. I don't think they even heard the last part, and after three days rise again. He had said that before, early in His ministry, before these guys even were a part of His life when He said, destroy this body, in three days I'll raise it up. Here He says it again. Did they know, Psalm 16, that the Holy One will not see corruption, but the Lord will show them the path of life, a prophecy of the resurrection? Peter preached on that res resurrection passage, didn't he, on the day of Pentecost. When Peter preached the resurrection, on the first day the church was born and the Spirit came, he chose Psalm 16, which proves the resurrection. Did they not know Isaiah 53 ends in verses 10 to 12 that the Messiah will be glorified and exalted and lifted up after His substitutionary sacrificial death in which He dies as a substitute for transgressors? The resurrection is certain. It's as certain as the crucifixion. So the bad news is really good news because He's going to be killed, but He's going to be killed for you. He's going to die in your place. He's going to be basically punished for your sins, made sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He'll become a curse for us, Galatians 3. And then Matthew 16, 21 says, from that time on, Jesus began to show His disciples. It's the mystery. Elisha is plowing, and Elijah says something to him. He says, uh, well, actually, he says it with an action, not with words. He throws his cloak on Elisha, which represents the potential for miracles. And when Elijah's cloak, remember, he's the great miracle worker who stood before Ahab, who ran from Jezebel and who found Elisha plowing in a field, and he throws his mantle, the symbol of potential. I don't know who this is for, but God is throwing something your way today. I wish I could throw this microphone right at your forehead so you would just get it, but it's expensive. And he doesn't say much about it. It's very mysterious. It's very mysterious. And when Elisha receives that mantle, he doesn't immediately perform a miracle. In fact, let me tell you how mysterious potential is. We don't hear Elisha's name again until 2 Kings chapter 2, which many tell us was 13 years after his potential was first suggested. But his potential was not revealed until he would take that same cloak and strike the water with it after a long season of obedience. Y'all got to know where to shout. That's where to shout. Because that's where potential is proven when it is planted. 
implanted. It's on the device, but it can only be retrieved from the device through a process of connection. And this process of connection in seed speak revolves around planting, which makes me think, first of all, of the sower. Because when the sower plants a seed, remember, farmers don't have funeral over seed that they scatter. Instead, they have expectation to see it again in a greater form later. So you're never really saying goodbye to anything that you give to God. You're really just opening your hands, which means that before you can receive anything, you have to release something. For those of you who like to take notes, you can write down the word release, because process is revealed in potential, and potential is revealed in process. And it comes a little bit along and along, but the first step is to release. The sower must release the seed to see what it could be. I'm just wondering, is there something that you need to release in your life today? And could it be possible that you are looking at something, praying about something, and trying to manipulate something that God wants you to release so that it can mature and manifest? And this is for all of us who are control freaks. Because until we release it, it can't grow. Look at your neighbor, say, Let it go. Tell them, Watch it grow. Let it go and watch it grow. But it can't grow if you're trying to control it. Right? It's starving seeds and then it's strangled seeds. Holding on so tight. Oh, it's my time. It's my money. I feel so sorry for people who aren't generous. I feel so bad for you because all stinginess does is strangle the seed that God has given you. And if you could let it go, who knows what it could be? What if I just preached this sermon in the mirror? It would bounce right back. But if I put it out through that camera, it might hit Botswana and help somebody in their life. Or Bamberg, South Carolina. I don't care. It's God's business where it goes. It's my job to sow it. And you got to sow it in the morning, sow it in the evening, sow it when you feel it, sow it when you don't. Sow it when they cheer for you, sow it when they criticize you. Sow it when they hosanna, and sow it when they want to string you up. Sow it when they notice, sow it when they don't. Sow it, sow it, sow it. But just like you can't live your life not accessing everything that's on the device and expect to be a reflection of the image of God, you also, and I want to say this is so important because when we talk about potential, a lot of people start trying to produce something that God did not put inside of them. We got oranges wanting to be apples, apples wanting to be kumquats. You're not a kumquat. You are a delicious red apple. You're going to be a big, juicy red apple, but you will not be a kumquat. Yo, my barber told me a story the other day. His name is Fly Ty. That's who you want to cut your hair. He put Fly in his name. I trust him with my fade because he's Fly Ty. And he's been cutting my hair now. He attends our university city location. I asked his permission to tell you this because I didn't want to embarrass him. But y'all, he told me the dumbest story ever the other day. And he was cutting my hair, and he has this bad habit of stopping cutting my hair while he tells me a 15 minute story, and he needs to go to multitask school because I got things to do. He's a cutting the clippers off and talking, but it's fine because I usually like his stories and his anecdotes, but this one was dumb. Listen to this. He told me a story, and I don't remember exactly what the year was, but years ago he was hosting because he's not only a barber, he's a, um, a host, a radio personality. He works for the Hornets. 
Uh, he's very involved in the community. He speaks to little kids. Like every time he cuts, comes to cut my hair, he's recently spoken to a group of kids that same day. And he DJed a wedding. And he cured cancer. And he fought a fire on Providence Road. And he's just everywhere all the time. But he was sitting there telling me the story because we're talking about potential and what God has put in you. And we talk about this a lot. We we talk about God. And I guess because my dad was a, was a barber, I, I just have a love for barbers. And so the clippers start going. We start talking. And we were talking about it. And he told me a story that Jay Z came to a concert, I guess it was like in the 90s, before he was as popular as he is now. And the concert was half full. And Fly Tie was one of the hosts for the concerts. And he said he observed Jay Z during the concert talking to one of the members of a female group who was also on the concert bill called Destiny's Child. And he said that the concert was half full because Jay-Z was just, just on the come up, which would lead him to be, uh, some would say, the greatest rapper of all time. Depending on how you uh, quantify that, it's a very strong case. But he said, I've since thought back to that day. I'm going to close this service. I'm going to ask you to sow a seed in this moment. I'm not going to make you sow it. I'm just asking you to sow a seed into this moment. I want you to sow into truth. Listen to this. I want you to sow into revelation knowledge because I want the spirit of revelation to come on you until you can preach this out of your head, until you can teach it in your sleep. I want the engrafted word of God to remain in the earth because now hell has loosed new demons coming against us like we've never been tried before. And I want you to sow into truth, not pews, not buildings, not suits, not clothes, but truth. Because Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Not the gimmicks, not the libations, not the holidays, not the ceremonies. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Anybody free in here? If you want your son free, expose them to the truth. If you want your daughter free, expose them to the truth. It's not religious dogma that liberates people. It's knowing who God is and what God is able to do. And scoot over and let somebody else be saved other than you. By grace are ye saved. He hath raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places. So I've sat in Romans tonight. I visited Genesis tonight. I closed in Ephesus tonight. And all of it is teaching one truth. And if you enter into it and you dare to study, you're not going to get this by shouting. You're going to get this by study to show yourself approved. And the reason I'm frantic about it is. It's because the old war horses are leaving. The old war horses are passing off the scene. And we got to make sure, <laughs> hallelujah, that something real continues to stand up and declare who Jesus is. Hallelujah. They're running around trying to find Jesus' girlfriend. No, get out of my face. We need somebody to declare who Jesus is. His woman was the church. We are the bride of Christ. You got to know your word. You got to know what you believe and where you stand. And it's not about arguing with people. It's not about fighting people. It's about being firmly planted. Because the Bible said if your feet are planted firmly in the house of the Lord, you will flourish in the courts of our God. So God says, if you remember to be planted in the house of God, I'll cause you to flourish outside of the house in the courts. You've been praying to flourish, but you haven't been planted. <laughs> if you would be planted and be stable 
and start being in and out and sometimes here and sometimes not. If you be planted in the house of God, in the truth of God, the word of God, I'm not talking about the building, then God said, I'll cause you to flourish. Prosperity is a byproduct. It is not the goal. It's a byproduct. Seek ye first the kingdom of God in its righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So if you want all these things to be added, seek ye first the kingdom. Invest in the truth. You got a seed, you got a seed, you're online, you got a seed, sow into the truth. I want the spirit of revelation and knowledge to fall on you. I want it to fall on you till you can teach, whether they call you a teacher or not. I want it to fall on your ministry. I want it to fall, if you don't do nothing but teach your children, I want you to know the truth so well that you don't have to send them to nobody to teach them who brought you over. I want the spirit of revelation to fall on you until you fall in love with your Bible, not your preacher. Because your preacher's going to die, but your Bible's still going to be here. I want I to direct you back to God, the Father of lights, in whom there is no... Oh, I got to quit. I, stop it. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, shut up, Abasha. In whom there is no variableness, nor shadow of turning. We got people who love church, but don't know God. Pass the seed to the left. I pray for every seed that's sown online, in the building, anywhere, anyone, any person who is interested in going deeper in the Word, who's willing to dig into the revelation, who's willing to wrestle with the Scriptures, that Christ might dwell in their hearts by faith, that they'd start walking in the Word and talking in the Word and thinking in the Word and living in the Word. I pray that the people that sowed tonight would get so in the Word that they'd get happy about the Word, that they start reading and giggling, that revelation would fall on them until you start opening up secrets to them and they deepen their relationship with you. All of these people who are trying to get to touch the preacher, I'm praying that they get to touch you and that the power of God would overshadow them in such a supernatural way. <laughs> that they would appreciate men, but they would only honor God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen, amen, amen. Serve the people that gave quickly. God bless you for your seed. God bless you for tuning in tonight. God bless you for your study. Bible class shouldn't end when the lights go out. This ought to provoke you to study. Anybody hungry? Anybody hungry for God? I challenge you to study the book of Romans. Study the book of Romans. It's not the only book, but since I'm teaching on Romans, it's going to be easier for you to see the touch points of Romans because I spent two weeks teaching on it and go back on YouTube and stop it and read your Bible and start it back up again. See, you got, you're the only generation in the history of the church that can click a button and hear the message taught at the pace of your learning. Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin looking. Tammy's story shocked the nation. The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead, the best evidence, the best witness was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. Have you ever watched The Exorcist and wondered, are demons real? Well, we interviewed a leading exorcist to find out, and the truth was shocking. Tell me who you are. The one you won't get out. The one you can't. Levitations, vomiting, spitting at the priest with an uncanny marksmanship. 
Well, that has not been a movie for me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. In 1967, Joseph Stalin's only daughter flees Russia for her new home, America. Hello to everybody. I am very happy to be here. That story alone is worthy of a podcast, but Svetlana Svetlana is about what comes next, and it's the craziest story I've ever heard. It has KGB agents, a Frank Lloyd Wright commune, weird sex stuff, three Olgas, two Svetlanas, and one neurotic gay playwright. That's me. Listen to Svetlana Svetlana on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up at the top of the hour in entertainment news, Beyonce. And that's where the employees park. How many y'all? How many y'all know? How many people got a parking lot? Oh, wow. We're moving <laughs> on to Janie oh. in St. Pete. Uh, <laughs> Janie says, there, dog. Hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> "Below, below the belt." Hold the truth. Mm-hmm. And right. what happened? Welcome to episode 239 of the JBP podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. If it's loud, it's because I am backstage at Dad's show in Boston. I love seeing everyone at these shows. They're super fun. In this episode, Kurt Jaimungle and Dad discuss truth, God, science, and Kurt's documentary, Better Left Unsaid, which addresses what happens when the left goes too far and features people like Noam Chomsky and Steven Pinker. Kurt is a Torontonian filmmaker behind Islam and the Future of Tolerance. He's also a YouTuber at Theories of Everything with Kurt Jaimungle, where he explores topics like theoretical physics, consciousness, free will, and religion. I also wanted to quickly mention that Dad is on Parler. Parler is the world's premier free speech platform. It's like Twitter, but it doesn't randomly kick you off for being reasonable. There are now exclusive posts by Dad, so be sure to get the app and give him a follow or check out the link in show notes. As always, if you're sick of hearing me read ads, visit jordanbpeterson.supercast.com to sign up for the ad-free version plus other perks. It works on all major platforms and it's just $10 a month. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hello everyone, I'm pleased today to have with me Kurt Jaimungle. He's a Toronto-based filmmaker with a background in mathematics and physics who directed and wrote the film Better Left Unsaid, which was released in April 2021. That film explores the question of, among other things, when does the left go too far? He's also the host of the Theories of Everything podcast and YouTube channel, which explores consciousness, God, free will, theoretical physics, and which just surpassed 100,000 subscribers in about one year, about one year's time. He's interviewed people including Steven Pinker, Noam Chomsky, and John Verveke on the cognitive science side, and Stephen Wolfram, Eric Weinstein, and Sabine Hossenfelder. On the physics side, you can find out more by visiting youtube.com forward slash theories of everything or searching theories of everything on Spotify, iTunes, or virtually any of the other audio platforms. So you've been podcasting and running this YouTube channel for how long? About a year? Uh, Yeah, slightly longer than a year. Now the channel has been up for approximately three years in the sense that it was registered three years ago, but I've been going at it with force for about one year and a bit. So who who has, who have you interviewed that's been most popular? Hmm. Hmm. Noam Chomsky, and you're, you're, you're one of the reasons why, because I was the first person, if not the only person, to ask him about you directly. Uh-oh. So I don't know about that. So there's something we could talk about right away. So what did he have to say? Well, essentially, you're Hitler, as you know. And, oh, yeah. 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 And, that, and so why do you think he thinks that? that? I think that people who are on a certain side on the political spectrum believe their side stands for what's good and the opposite side is what's not good. One of the, see, that's so tricky, man, talking about better left than said, which we'll get to later, is how do you define the left and the right? It's decidedly difficult. Almost everyone has a different definition. Chomsky would say, well, the left is freedom. And so anything that's 
on the right is anti-freedom and the right people who are on the right or identify with being as such would perhaps categorize it as the opposite yeah well it's interesting at least that they might circle around claims to some uh let's say virtue that both of them would admire like freedom right mm -hmm. so there's some agreement there despite the different difference did he point to anything particular about what i hypothetically thought that made me not an acceptable sort of creature no it's somewhat it's somewhat hearsay in the sense that he read an article based on you so he didn't watch you directly he read nathan robinson's critique of you which i'm sure oh yeah of. well that'll do it man yeah 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 old nathan yeah. he's he's quite the character yeah i see so well that's too bad in many regards did you learn anything in particular from talking to Dr. Chomsky? A quite a significant amount. As for what I can point to, let me think. I spoke to him six times, six times on the channel. So the first time about you, I found it interesting that he said, I asked each guest that I spoke to at the time, because now I've pivoted away from politics for, reason we, for reasons we can get to later. I asked him and every other guest, when does the left go too far? In some sense, it's a Petersonian question, because you've raised that quite a few times. When does the left go too far? He said, well, it's not a matter of going too far for the left. It's a matter of tactics. As for when does the right go too far? He said, well, the right is suicidal, I think was his words. Hmm. So that's, that's interesting, because eh? it's really not much of an answer. I mean, I've been always looking for a technical definition of that, right? It's like, well, we know the right can go too far, and we know the left can go too far, and how do we point to, and I think this problem has actually become more complicated rather than less because the more I've been thinking about it, the more I think that the errors on the left are more in the nature of a vast number of small errors, mostly of, often of omission. So the more um, reasonable people on the left kowtow too rapidly to the more radical types on the left, especially at the philosophical level. And I think that really happened at the universities. So well, that's a one like that's something we can explore. Well, it's actually a question I would have for you. Why do you think that is? I know that this is more, mainly you interviewing me, but I'm still perplexed when it comes to that. Why is it that the center left doesn't excoriate the extreme left? Is it because it's, they're on the same side? So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Or are they afraid? Because well, they can get, you can lose even a tenured position. Well, I think there's, I think that fear, and it isn't obvious to me that this is merely a problem that affects the left, but I'm most familiar with it in the university circumstance. And so what I saw happening in my 25 years as a faculty member, let's say, I think that's about right. It's more than that actually, but anyways, quite a long time, three decades, let's say. Um, was that whenever the administration pushed on the faculty, so in our faculty meetings, for example, there would be administrative demands and they were often unreasonable. They would increase the size of our, our seminars, say for our third and fourth year students, ask us to do more work with fewer resources. And that was a steady trend. Like if you look at spending, say on faculty salaries, versus spending on administrative salaries across universities in the West, broadly speaking, but certainly mm -hmm. in North America, the amount spent on administration just skyrocketed upward, whereas the amount spent on faculty pretty much stayed constant. And so why? Well, it was because the faculty just retreated continually every time they were challenged to say no. And so I objected repeatedly in faculty meetings whenever that happened and said, well, why don't we just say Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and you're listening to the Bible in a Year podcast, where we encounter God's voice and live life through the lens of Scripture. The Bible in a Year podcast is brought to you by Ascension. Using the Great Adventure Bible timeline, we'll read all the way from Genesis to Revelation, discovering how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. It is day 359. We're reading from the book of Revelation, chapters 1, 2, and 3, as well as the conclusion of St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapters 3 and 4. We're also reading the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 8 and 9. As always, the Bible translation I'm reading from is the Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic edition. I'm using the Great Adventure Bible from Ascension. If you want to download your own Bible in a year reading plan for these last seven days, you can visit ascensionpress.com slash Bible in a year. And uh, that'll be neat. You can also subscribe to this podcast for the last week. And then, you know, it's one of those things. Let go of your pride. Let go of your pride. Just, just subscribe. Come on.
<laughs> just kidding. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. I'm just joking around. It is day 359. We are reading Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3, 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4, as well as Proverbs chapter 31, verses 8 and 9. The Revelation to John, the Apocalypse, chapter 1, Introduction and Salutation. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants what must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written therein, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you, and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, everyone who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. A Vision of Christ I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth issued a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Now write what you see, what is and what is to take place hereafter. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Chapter 2. The Message to Ephesus To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear evil men, but have tested those who call themselves apostles but are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The Message to Smyrna And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. But for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who conquers shall not be hurt by the second death. The Message to Pergamum And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice immorality. So you also have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. The Message to Thyatira And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her doings, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay upon you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. He who conquers and who keeps my words until the end, I will give him power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received power from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3. The Message to Sardis And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the name of being alive, and you are dead. Awake and strengthen what remains. A new communicable virus that could take down the world. 25 years ago. So I, I picked up this book. I was so obsessed with it. I flew to meet these two authors in their home in Virginia, and I interviewed them for a program I had called Power Talk, where I used to interview people. And so I was 37 years old. I'm now 62. And we have the privilege to have here in person, one of those two authors has passed away, but we're here with Mr. Howe. Please give a big hand for one of the great authors, Neil Howe. Thank you, brother. Grab a seat. It's great to have you back. Um, a lot of people have read your book, some people have not. Let's start at the top. I tried to give the giant pattern to save time so we could get into some of the more deeper pieces, but give people an understanding how this all came about. I mean, you're, you, you've got expertise as a historian, you've got expertise in finance. Uh, give people a sense, how did you first come across these discoveries together for generations, and then how did Fourth Turning come about? Yeah, this was, uh, this was back in the uh, late 80s. It was a long time ago. And uh, Bill and I were looking at generational differences. I mean, we're boomers, right? <laughs> obsessed with generational differences, yeah, that's right? right? I mean, we all knew that there had been no generation like us since this planet was, you know, first created. So, um, and we look back, we said, were there other times that this has ever happened? A big Promethean war winning generation, right? That completely reshaped America. These very self centered, idealistic kids growing up. And then, of course, at that time, we were aware that this generation coming up after us, cynical, pragmatic, right? X generation. Uh, yeah, gener Generation X uh, really was, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in it for the money. And uh, they just hated yuppies, you know? <laughs> they hated disco and they hated yuppies. Uh, but we went back and found that this had happened again and again. And not only had it happened before, we went all the way back to the Great Migration in New England back in the 1630s and looked at this entire panorama of how many centuries and found again and again, not only were generations very distinct and people at the time understood that generations were different. This is this a myth that, you know, generational differences are just a product of, of our age. Not true. And what we found that each generation has a different location in history. Mm. That makes all the difference because it's how old you are when a big event hits 
that shapes how you learn about it, right? So if you're a child during a big traumatic event, what's your job? What's your social role? Stay out of the way. Don't bother adults. Keep it all to yourself because no one wants to hear your complaints. Be helpful, right? Generally, a lot of repression goes on among kids. Talk about the silent generation today. You ever want to know why Joe Biden's generation, uh, you know, uh, 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 that whole group yes. is so mannerly, so over-socialized, so considerate, so nice? This is the nicest generation of 80-somethings <laughs> we're ever going to see in our lifetime. If you wait until boomers reach their 80s, you're not going to want to say hello to them on the street. Okay. <laughs> But they're nice today. Yes. Why? Every, every phase of life they went through, they've been nice. Yes. They were nice 30-somethings. They were nice 40 Because they were protected. Because, during, during and, but they had to keep it to themselves. They, had yeah. to be, they were over-socialized during the time of war. But this has happened since the beginning. Now, if you're just over the age of service, this is why even one year of birth... Yeah, explain that. Well, you wrote your book. I remember reading this. Grabbed me during the Vietnam War. If you were born July, or, excuse me, December thirty first at eleven fifty nine, versus January first at twelve oh one. What could the get, difference? You be? get sorted in different school classrooms, right? That determines which class you are. That determines whether you go to war or not. That determines whether you're laid off at your first job or not. And we know economists tell us all the time that makes huge life cycle differences in how you later succeed economically. Whether you were drafted or not could right. be determined by one minute of birth. Exactly. So you do have generation. Now, not all generations have this, you know, knife age division. Occasionally you have these, um, you have these uh, kind of, you know, zones of mm -hmm. transition. Um, you know, you have a lot, yeah, a lot of early wave uh, millennials today. People in their, you know, early early eighties, maybe eighty born, eighty three, eighty four. They call themselves exennials. Yes. You know, because they're millennials, they're sheltered, they're all taught everything is nice, but they're just old enough to remember when things weren't that sheltered. So, right. even within generations, generations can be generation of trends. But my main point is, is that every role of every it, your your role of life in your age determines how you react to that event. And then as you move to see older events, that actually determines which events you will likely trigger as you get older and reach the age of leadership. You become leader of a political institution. You become, you know, parents of your family. You're creating decisions in the community. So the overall lesson is history shapes generations young, but then generations as they get older shape history. So it's a complete circle of life you see going on here. In fact, the big lesson of generations is that, that those seasons of life you're talking about, who you are and how history works is determined by the overlap between your seasons of your life and the seasons of history. So we looked at this. We found that, for instance, uh, we had constantly found that when you have this, this hero generation, Go, you know, that, that completely reshapes the society, goes through a major war, society publicly reshapes who it is, that you have this generation born after the war that's, that's very rebellious, idealistic, and so on, and, and, and knows nothing but affluence. And then the generation just after them is the cynical, you know, detached. Anyway, you see this again and again. So what we learned from that, Tony, is that this is actually tied to a cycle of history itself. It's not just a cycle of generations, a cycle of history. Think about it. The great civic remakings of American history. I mean, if you want to go back, and I'm talking about colonial history too, but one of the first great makeovers of our kind of civic identity, uh, a lot of it happened in England at the time. Of course, at that time, late 17th century, you know, all of the immigrants from the old world were almost entirely English speaking. In fact, a lot of them <laughs> actually were immigrants. About half of them were still immigrants. But my point is, is it was a glorious revolution and there was an enormous rebellion in the colonies too. It all happened in the 1670s, 1680s. That was the first enormous crisis in American history. And it was a time of great war too. We were at war with New France. The, the, the French had settled over over Canada. So that was the first great crisis. And then about 80, 90 years later, we had the American Revolution. 80, 90 years later, we had the Civil War. And I think I need not describe what the Civil War was for America, right? But 
absolute, even absolute numbers. Forget share of the population. By far the most deadly, deadlier than all the other conflicts combined. Yes. And then 80 or 90 years later, the Great Depression, World War II. 80 or 90 years, late, 90 years later, guess what? We're right. Uh, just shuts down all meaningful communication. And the idea of regeneration, the idea of secondary causes, um, Brother Tassi just pretty much dismisses those as, as equivocation and... Um, I don't know how he deals with the many places in Scripture where those very concepts are are plainly presented to us, um, but that's that's what happens, and and the result is this. Um, well, you know, I, I said last time, you know, um, this is the view of I wouldn't even recognize my faith uh, if I didn't know that it that was what was being described. I mean, the straw man misrepresentations just. Over and over and over again, and and it it, it doesn't advance the conversation um, to just simply say I will not allow you to have the categories that that you uh, have established via biblical exegesis. And um, um, it is interesting that by the end of this clip, I, I really do believe that what we'll hear is the exact same argument of the objector in Romans chapter nine, which that's what will make this relevant, I think, to uh, tomorrow evening's discussion. So God causes my evil. That's universal determinism, too. I didn't have a choice in my evil. Oh. Now, of course, you know, Brother Tassie knows that we say um, that to say cause in this fashion, in the sense of primary causes and secondary causes, is invalid. Uh, but he just simply dismisses the existence of, of primary and secondary causes. Um, if, if God has a sovereign decree that includes the existence of evil, then God is the author of evil. That's just, that's just it. There can be, uh, again, this is, this is a really extreme example of compressing the, the full orbed biblical view of God's relationship with his creation down into a one dimensional, uh, flat pancake. Uh, where you just you just squish all the biblical revelation out of it, and all the depth of revelation, and you just you just you just make everything equal to everything else, and and try to simplify it to a point that it, it just becomes a a, a canard. It becomes a, just a, a horrific misrepresentation of the reality. And of course, I think we can validly ask why would why would you do that? Um, and it would seem that. The answer is because that's the best argument I can come up against it. But again, that's that's not the way we should be doing things. That's not how the dialogue should actually uh, take place. Well, that's through secondary causes. What? Are you kidding me? Are you it's kidding me? It's a contradiction. Me? No, it's, it's not a contradiction. Um, over and over again, Brother Tassie will talk about contradiction without accurately using the term in any meaningful philosophical sense. Um, when someone provides a coherent, uh, consistent methodology for defining the categories in which they're speaking, uh, for example, the categories of uh, divine autonomy versus creaturely freedom, uh, these have been established uh, for the reformed person from biblical exegesis, from example. Um, if you simply deny them by saying, that's ridiculous, and then turn around and say, see, you're contradicting yourself, that's not a valid argument. Um, that, unfortunately, is extremely common in our day in most public discourse, but as, as Christian people, we are to be people of truth and, and people of integrity in our argumentation. It's not a valid argument. Uh, simply saying, well, I, I deny your uh, categories, even though you've established the proper grounds of those categories, and have given examples of those categories. Um, that's, that's trying to win by changing the definitions of words uh, rather than uh, seeking a common ground and then, as Christians, arguing from the Word of God. That's, that's not a proper approach. But people are flocking to it. Why? Because they love that concept of my sin was caused by God. I've never heard a single Reformed person in my entire life ever say anything that absurd. Never. I, I've never... I've been in Reformed churches for decades now, and I have met with um, tens of thousands of Reformed people, and not a one of them uh, has ever indicated, thought, given any, any 
idea whatsoever um, that that is even the beginning of an attractive idea. Uh, first of all, we don't believe it. We deny it. Uh, we, we've denied it from the very beginning. Um, so to say this is why people are flocking to <laughs> Reformed theology um, is, is just, uh, again, it, it's hard to understand why such a, such a statement would ever be made. There's, there's no foundation for it within Reformed writing, within Reformed thought. It's, it's just um, a, a straw man on a level that's difficult, really, to begin to comprehend. Um, and I'm really hoping that Brother Tassie has abandoned all of this, but the videos are still up, so, you know, I was able to get, get hold of them. So uh, common sense would be, yes, this is still my, my perspective, I'm just being hopeful uh, that maybe it isn't. Um, but that, that type of a statement is just unworthy of anyone because um, it, it, it really is, is worse than almost anything I've ever heard a Reformed person say about, uh, about the Arminians. Uh, they want to be Arminians because, and then some, I've heard some really weird things, but that, that one, that one goes beyond anything I've heard going the other direction. They're flocking to it. The evil becomes good and convolutes between is evil evil or is evil good? Because God calls my evil, it's got to be good. That's what I'm thinking. And I'm attracted to that. You know, again, um, uh, complete canard. Um, no one says that. No one believes that. I, I, I would love to see uh, Brother Tassi provide a, a single example of this from anyone. Um, from my, my books, my writings, uh, R.C. Sproul, John Piper, who, 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 who are you going to come up with? Um, it, it, it's such a fundamental misunderstanding that it, it simply has to be abandoned. It, it simply has to be abandoned for any kind of meaningful uh, conversation to take place. And they equivocate and they move with grace and beauty between these two contradictions and people are like, wow, that's cool. And it's a total blatant logical fallacy. But if it's played carefully, like a card dealer moving the cards around carefully, it sounds pretty good. James White's one of the best at this. He wrote a book called Potter's Freedom. It's a response to Geisler's book, Chosen But Free. Now, jo Chosen But Free, it's an honest title. It says, I'm chosen, but I'm free. And the rest of Norman Geisler's book goes to explain how it's chosen but free. And James White's response title was Potter's Freedom, Universal Determinism. In a title called Potter's Freedom, that means there's no other freedom but God's freedom. And in James White's book, Debating Calvinism with Dave Hunt, it starts 